will have the heart that will accept it and then put it into practice. We also pray for Pastor that the Lord will speak through him. We pray that every word that the Lord has prepared for him to us today, that he will be able to speak the exact word. We pray that he will not miss the word. He will not say things from his own will, but then he will speak exactly what the Lord has instructed him to in the name of Jesus. We pray also for all those on their way that the Lord will guard them and then bring them here safely. We pray those who are not able to join us, whatever it is that is keeping them from joining us, we pray that the Lord will meet them at their point of needs in the name of Jesus. Father, unto you we give you all the glory. We bless your holy name. Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercies. Father, thank you the gifts of salvation. Thank you for helping us, us oh Lord, to, to meet together, together in your, your presence. presence. We pray in the name of Jesus that, Father, as we begin today's service, that you will be with us from the beginning to the end. Father, guard us in everything that we are going to do here and help us, O Lord, that our hearts, O Lord Jesus, will be in today's service. Help us to worship you in truth and in spirit. Teach us the right way to worship you, O Lord. In the name of Jesus, have you prayed with us, given. Amen. 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 Hello, doctors in our midst. Please, I, I, I said doctors. I didn't say students. Hello, doctors in our midst. Hello, Cindy. Dr. Cindy. Dr. Shadi. Dr. Apps. Dr. Apps. Hello. Hello. Doctors, doctors. We are so proud of you, doctors. We thank God for... They will be done on Wednesday. Yeah. They are, so they are, they, are, they are just done. Hey, Amy, how many years? Seven years, eh? <laughs> Amy, seven years. You are still seven years to go. Wow, Amy. Are you sure you, you get there? <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's welcome everyone to church. It's wonderful to see you all. You are all looking so lovely. And the doctors who are giving us the doctor looks and things. Nice ones, nice ones, nice ones. Hello, doctors. <laughs> Lead us to the tower of praise and worship. And please, the potential for this. Happy for this day, okay? Hey, everybody. S since, since the girls will not say anything to oh, us, we let we me did, say it did, to you. All right, happy day. for this day. <laughs> <laughs> for today and for everything he has done for us and we pray that as we praise and worship him he inhabits in our praise and in our worship amen Sacrifice of praise into the heart of the Lord. We bring sacrifice of praise into the heart of the Lord. We bring sacrifice. We bring sacrifice of praise into the heart of the Lord. We bring sacrifice of praise into the heart of the Lord. We bring sacrifice.
Amen. Today is a new day the Lord has made. I rejoice and be glad in it. As we enter a time of worship, bring this worship in spirit and in truth. And our worship ourselves to the most high God. As we give him all the praise and we say yes in need.
How's the exams going? Very enthusiastic. Uh, uh, Maria's got one more on Tuesday, and then she's done. And uh, so, um, anything we can specially be praying for today? I praise the Lord that. Uh, well, I, I took some medical tests this week, and they decided to take a biopsy in my stomach. Uh, they have to check that. We'll find out that in a, in a week or so. And uh, but otherwise, they said there's some more or less okay. We'll find out tomorrow what they say. So um, praise the Lord for a trip I took on Friday. Uh, I don't know how many kilometers. I didn't really check it, but spent the whole tank of gas going around. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm going to pray for Olya. She was had a, the atmosphere pressure changed the last, she got a headache, so she was feeling pretty bad, so she stayed home. So, But she was feeling a little better this noon, so I praise the Lord for that. Anything else health-wise? Otherwise? Well, before we go to Lord of Prayer, let's repeat the verse that we have. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8b and 12b. So, Revelation 2, talking about who Jesus is. Remember that he is the result, or he is the um, answer to our problems. Revelation chapter 2. These are the words who is the first and the last. Who died and came to life again. First and last who died and came to life again. Okay. And then these are the words... Of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. So, he's the first and the last and has a double-edged sword. We're going to talk about a couple more characteristics of him today. But before we do that, let's just go with the Lord in prayer. And, um, and, and walk with him there. Thank you, Father, that you love us. And we can come to you and, and worship you. I thank you for this last week. For that you've helped the different students in their exams. And I pray that you, the results will be um, uh, honoring to you. I thank you for the test that Maria was able to take, and I pray that you'll um, help us to rejoice in what you are going to give her as far as the, uh, the marks. Bless this coming week and different uh, lessons in school. Bless family that's far and wide, and I pray especially for those who are um, not feeling well, I pray for Olya, I pray she'll continue to help her to recover and uh, help me as well. Thank you that you're a healing God. I pray that you'll bless uh, Russia, America, Ghana, Nigeria, and other places uh, that we're from, the United States. But thank you that. Uh, we can call to you and you answer us. And that you can rule over rule in the affairs of men. Lord, I pray for uh, Sedefromovich, uh, the, the children's home there. And a special camp there. I pray that you'll bless the people that are holding that camp. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless the uh, ministry in Atradnaya. And give Katya and Dima wisdom there. In that blessing, the church in Danilivka, I uh, pray that you provide a pastor for that church. I pray that you bless Koinonia. Help us as we uh, worship you together, to worship you in spirit and truth. Help us to recognize who you are in the presence, in your presence here. Bless and keep us. Help us to walk with you and serve you. And uh, I pray for your church. 
that are suffering around the world especially. Pray that you will allow each one to be able to recognize your presence. And may your word go forth in power all through the world, wherever your word is preached. Now, people come to know and love you and serve you. I pray that you help us to concentrate on you, even with the music right now that's being played. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I mentioned this last week, I went on a trip with Vitalis Segevich. And I um, went on a visit. He wanted to visit a couple places, and, uh, and we wanted to... Uh, Relating to um, trip also in the in the United States, but it's an interesting trip. We visited a church that one time was a growing and was a nice sized church. They have a building, but uh, we, had, we met people there that uh, there was four people left in the church. Two women, two men, and the youngest was in his 50s. That's all that's left. They meet together regularly, and there's some people come from different churches to, uh, to help them and visit them and have communion and such. But um, one of the questions we had, and uh, we, were talking, we talked about that, is Will this church live or die? Will it stop existing? I know that there are many places in Russia where the church is dying. In fact, there's whole, whole oblasts, whole regions where the church members is, is going and, and churches are closing. But I also know a couple places in Volgograd where the church seemed to be dying and now it's thriving. Why do churches die? Why do churches die? I think some churches die because a church has abandoned their first love. Like we saw in the Ephesian church. I once read that the average age of a church in America is 70 years. From birth to death. Oh, it might still exist, but the church eventually is going to close. Because it's gotten to a point where it's, uh, they can't pay the bills for a building that they have. There are not enough people. And, uh, and it, it dies. And if there isn't a renewal of, of a love and a, and a passion for the truth, a church will die. See, a church started with people having, how would you say, a passion for the truth, a passion for Christ, a love for Christ, love for others, and the church grows. Sometimes they build a building. But as the founders of the church grow older, after two or three generations, if there's not a renewal of this passion, the church starts declining and it dies. Some churches do not endure persecution. Uh, as uh, the church in Smyrna and it was facing persecution, eventually it died out. In the North African, I don't know if you know this, but in North Africa, that used to be one of the strongholds of Christianity. That's hard to find some churches in North Africa today. Turkey's the same way. Center of Christianity, Eastern Christianity, used to be Istanbul. And now, I think this last year, they turned a big, huge church that was uh, the, the centerpiece of thing into a mosque. Before World War II, North Korea had the greatest growing churches in the Korean Peninsula. 
But when communism came in and persecution, there are still Christians there. But the church is really underground and, and difficult. Maybe if all of a sudden uh, there's a change, maybe that church will grow greatly. I've heard about, there was a time in Ethiopia, and I try to look it up, where there were some missionaries going in and they had a few churches started and then all the missionaries got kicked out and they were wondering what will happen to the church. There's a time of persecution. And when uh, after, I don't know, it was like 15, 20 years or, or something, maybe less, the church came back, the missionaries came back, they found a, a growing, thriving church. A church that persevered in persecution. Sometimes a church dies not because of abandoning its first love or because of persecution. Sometimes a church abandons its biblical foundations like the church in Pergamon. They accept false teaching. When you don't have true teaching of the gospel, pretty soon the gospel means nothing. And it just becomes a club. Europe used to be the center of Christianity. Today, it's, it's, it's the continent with one of the least percentages of evangelical Christians. Europe. Why? Because there was a result in a theology that denied the authority of God's word denied that the deity of Christ. And so the foundations of Christianity said, oh, there wasn't a real resurrection. And it just became a club. In, in Europe, materialism, comfort, immorality has become the god of many. And what people call love, the Bible calls perversion. The same for many churches in America as well. Today we're going to look at another church. Jesus said the church was dead. It's just the church is Sardis. Let's just read what the Bible says. Revelation chapter three, verses one through six. To the angel in the church in Sardis, write. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. I remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the church spirit says to the churches. Here Jesus describes a church that is dead, even though many people said, wow, that's a live church. But Jesus says, no, you're not alive, you're dead. You maybe maybe I call it a zombie church, okay? People walking around. But they're really dead. It functions like a live church. There's church services, there's singing, there's prayers, there's preaching. There's maybe a lot of activity. But there's no real spiritual life in it. It's interesting that the, Jesus does not accuse the church of leaving or abandoning their first love. It doesn't warn the church that they're undergoing a good persecution. It doesn't say they got false doctrine. It just says that they're dead. 
Although he does say that there are some people who are alive. They have come to faith in Jesus Christ and they have a relationship with him. And here we must understand what the Bible says about being spiritually dead and what, what it means to be spiritually dead and spiritually alive. Each one of us was once spiritually dead. Okay? We all have sinned and we're separated from, from God. In fact, the Bible says we were God's enemies. Having no relationship with him whatsoever. All declared in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So, you might say each one of us is born physically alive and spiritually dead. So how does a person become spiritually alive? Ephesians 2 verses 4 to, 6, 4 to 10 says this. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It seems that in the city of Sardis, at one time there was a group of people that had confessed their sins and were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. These people were organized into a church and they learned and they grew and they loved people and they demonstrate a true life of God. There was holiness and they showed other people true love and holiness. Their lives reflected Christ-like behavior. But as time went on, people began gathering in the church that, well, they had no real relationship with Christ. Well, they did good things. They maybe said the, said the right words. But they had no real relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe they were the children and grandchildren of the founders of the church of Sardis. They learned to say the words. They learned to sing the songs. They learned to do the good deeds. But they never acknowledged that they were sinners in need of a savior. They had never come to faith in Christ. And so while they were in church, they were spiritually dead. Now, the question is, how can you determine if a person is spiritually alive or spiritually dead? You can't tell by looking, uh, uh, you know, necessarily at some outward appearances. Because I can look at what you do and say, but I can't really know your heart. God knows your heart. Although Jesus did give us a way we can understand if a person is a false teacher or a true teacher. He says, by the fruit of your life they will know them. In Matthew 7.20. And he goes on to say in Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only one, the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many, and this is surprising, 
Jesus says, many on that day will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did not we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never, ever knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So just very clearly, Scripture declares, there are people that come to church, they do good things, they act like Christians, they say they're Christians, but they have no true relationship with Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul describes in more detail the actions of such people who live according to their fleshly desires. And also he contrasts those that live according to the fruit of the Spirit. You see, in church service, sometimes we can't see a person's life. But during the week, they, or during Sunday, Sunday services, a person acts according to one way, and you go home and they act completely different. And you look in their lives, and you see a difference between the fruit of the flesh, or the... Or the, the um, fleshly desires, and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you, I didn't put this on a, as, as part of your lessons, and maybe just one in your, in your uh, group, small groups, you open Galatians chapter 5, 19, 26. Read that through to just help you to understand. How do I understand if a person is alive or dead? If a person's acting this way, it's probably they're spiritually dead. If a person's acting this way, or demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit, they're probably alive. Now, in order to help the Sardis church deal with the deadness in their church, Jesus presents himself as holding the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, what does this mean? Remember, last Sunday we said that all the problems are solved when we understand who Jesus is. And so Jesus comes and says, I have, hold the seven spirits, and the seven stars. This is a repeat of his God, uh, description of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. You remember when we studied that, the seven spirits can be best understand to say the sevenfold nature of the Holy Spirit. Not seven different spirits, but the sevenfold nature of the Holy Spirit. And the seven stars re represent the seven uh, leaders of the seven churches. Now, here, here we have something that is often repeated in the, in the book of Revelation, the word, the, the number seven, okay? Now, it's, 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 it, we have to be careful in Scripture when we talk about numbers. It's called numerology. And some people get way off in numerology, and they start setting certain dates when Christ is going to return and uh, all this type of a thing. But the word, the number seven, is not only is often repeated in the New Testament, in the in the whole Bible, and wherever it's repeated or used, it, it, it often gives the sense of completeness, divine completeness. Creation, God created what? He created the, the world in how many days? Six days. But we have a seven-day week. Why? Ever thought about that? If, why don't we have a six-day week? I mean, we celebrate the six days of creation. Why do we have a seven-day week? It's because... <coughs> excuse me. It seems creation is not complete without a day of rest or day to enjoy what is accomplished or and to worship God who made it possible. Okay? So it, it gives a powder and he says, work, 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 but take time out to see what God's accomplished in your life, to, um, to thank him for what he's done, to look for what he wants you to do in the future, to worship him for who he is. And if we don't take 
In that time out, our, day, our, our time, our, our life is not complete. We live an incomplete, um, incomplete life. Revelation 13, verse 8 says, The number of a man is six. And the number of the Antichrist is 666. It's man trying to be God. I think men try to be God all the time, right? And the more they try to be God, the more evil they become. A person is not complete without God. I'm six, but I need God. I need seven to be complete. I think that's why Jesus said to the church in Sardis, you're dead. You're six. You don't have the seven. You don't have me. He says, I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Um, now, it's interesting. Um, I learned something on Friday that I didn't know. Um, in the, I, I, I study in English. I don't always study in Russian. I really didn't open the Russian Bible to see what the Russian Bible said on this verse. And Vitaly Sergeyevich, he said, I preached on the seven churches in, in Revelation several times, but I didn't understand this phrase, this word. The Russian synodology uses the word not unfinished, but not perfect. I found your works not perfect. Or in, in Russian, it's nisavrshenny. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, just give you some Russian here. The word is very clear, close. Savershenny is savershenny. Okay? Savershenny is, is complete. Savershenny is perfect. Your, your work, works are not perfect or your nerves are not completed or finished. Okay? Now there's some English translations also that have this an idea of not perfect. Um, so, but which is it? Which is it? I think it's because it has unfinished because each one of us is not perfect. Anybody, anybody perfect here? I'm not raising my hand either. I'm not perfect. Okay. And no sermon is completely perfect. No song is song completely perfect, right? Right, Isaac? Or do you send perfect songs? No, okay. Everybody does something imperfect, okay? You may get a perfect grade on your exam, but that doesn't mean you know everything, right? So, um, we always sin. But we can come to faith in Jesus Christ and finish the task that God has set before us. This is possible. Paul said at the end of his life, that he had finished what God had told him to do. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. So Paul said, I did in my life what God wanted me to do. Okay? And I think in every stage in our lives, we, have, we must ask, ask ourselves, am I doing right now what God wants me to do? How many of you are graduating? Have you accomplished in Quinonia what God wants you to do? Or have you left a job unfinished? When I came to Russia, one of the things that I was struck with was the number of unfinished buildings. This building in which we are right now, when I came to Russia 23 years ago, was standing 22, 23, 22, 3 stories high. I don't know how many stories it is. And you get up a few stories and it was open. It was unfinished. And it stood that way for, I don't know, for 10, 15 years. Unfinished. But it happened. As they got this thing up, 
And then all of a sudden the building started shifting a little bit. The foundation was wrong. Okay? Now the building's finished. I think they, after, after standing here for, for so many years, they figure, well, the, probably the thing won't fall down. And they added some more uh, things for the foundation, and they changed the material, didn't put everything, bricks, you know, how things are built here, you know, big, thick brick walls. When you put up 23 stories of a big, thick, brick, big uh, thick brick walls, it's a lot of weight on the foundation. So they changed the technology. They increased the thing, and now we've got a building that hopefully will not fall down. The building Svetmir, you've been a, many of you have been a Svetmir, okay? It was an unfinished building that sat with, with the foundation pillars and a couple walls and a plitka for 20 plus years. until Transfiguration bought it, and then it sat for more because we had to work through the, the, the uh, document problems and then that didn't have the money, and, and that's another story. Unfinished. Why, th why, why do people start things and not finish them? Do you got a problem with that? I've got all kinds of projects that I've started and haven't finished. Sometimes people start things, they don't finish them because they haven't counted the costs before they started the project. Okay? In our spiritual lives, Jesus uh, used this when people just said, I'm going to follow Jesus. He said in Luke chapter 14, 26 to 30, if everyone comes to me, <clears throat> and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, that such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose of you wanting to build a tower, won't you sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? If you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Actually, just recently, Svetoy um, Troitsa, last year, I guess it was, built an unfinished house. Why? The person ran out of money. But let's return to the sevenfold spirit and the seven stars. In order to help us to come to faith in, in, in Christ and complete the work God has given us to do, I believe we must understand the complete nature of the work of the Holy Spirit. Because when we're talking spiritual life, we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, okay? By the way, do you know what day is this? You know what a special day is today? You know what today is today? What? In Russia, it's not Father's Day. In Russia, it's called Troyetsa. And Troyetsa in America is called the day of Pentecost the time the Holy Spirit came to unite people and begin the birthday of the church so that's that's the celebration today so you know I think it's appropriate that the Lord just said okay sevenfold spirits what is the what are the nature of the work of the Holy Spirit I think there's many things but just to, to fit it, you know, with, with, with what it says here, I thought I'd list seven of them. Okay, sevenfold spirit. Okay. What does the Holy Spirit do? He convicts a person of sin. That's where he begins in his work. Okay. And then 
He creates in a person a new spiritual birth. We're born of the Spirit. Okay? He convicts him of sin, and then by faith we come to him, and we believe in God, and God helps us to have faith in him, and we're born again. We're born by the Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. As a, when a person is born of the Spirit, and how do I know if a person's alive or dead? How do I know if they're born of the Spirit or not? Oh, I'd say, is there conviction of the Holy Spirit in their life? Can they sin and not, not be feeling guilty? Okay? Can they point to a time when they, there, there's been that spiritual birth? The Holy Spirit teaches a person. It's a person learning and growing. Okay? So, uh, whenever we examine people to uh, have for baptism, we ask them, he says, what's the Lord been teaching you recently? They've been learning something? Or do you think you know it all? The Holy Spirit not only teaches, He distributes spiritual gifts to people. Um, and allowing us to help and teach one another and serve one another. The Bible says the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayer life. Understanding how to pray and what to pray for. The Lord, the Holy Spirit helps us in our witness. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Okay? The Holy Spirit is there to help us be witnesses for Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is here to help us to worship God the Father, God the Son. I'm sure there's other aspects that I could mention. I thought I'd just mention those seven. Okay? Um, and so, the sevenfold nature of the Holy Spirit. I hope you're experiencing all those things. I hope you're, by the way, and then he says the seven spirits and the seven stars. Stars represent the, the, the ministry in the church. I think you're talking the complete ministry of the church. In other words, we have to understand that everyone needs to be using their gifts and abilities to serve the Lord. So I look and I say, he holds these seven stars. God has put gifted people in each church in order to serve. And the, the ministry of, of each one helps us to, to grow, to demonstrate spiritual life. Now, it's interesting. The only good thing Jesus says about this church in Sardis is that there's a remnant that have come to faith in Christ. And they have kept their faith. Revelation 2.4, You have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. These people dressed in white, they're dressed in white not because they were perfect. They don't come to, nobody comes to Jesus Christ and stands before God and say, look at my good deeds. You know what happens when somebody does that? Uh, Jesus says, look at that spot, look at that spot, look at this. Your, your clothes are dirty. The Bible says all our righteousness is on, as filthy rags. These people are dressed in white because they have received Christ by faith and they have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They are trusting in Christ's righteousness to come to God. They are not worthy in of themselves, but they are worthy because they have Jesus as a relationship. They have a relationship with him. What did the church need to do? The Bible says they need, to, Jesus says, remember what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. It's interesting, this church had everything they needed to do, that everything needed to live. Okay? Remember, 
You've got the necessary knowledge. To come to faith in Christ and also to complete the task that God has given you. You don't go to need to go to seminary right now to finish the job right now. Maybe in the future you might need to. Okay? But right now you have everything you need to do the job that God wants you to do. And to come to faith in Christ. They need to hold it fast. They need to, to take this knowledge that God had given them. Truly believe it. And show their belief by their deeds. They need to change the minds about the direction of their lives. The focus of their lives. It needs to be on Jesus, not on this world. In 1 Corinthians 11, 27-32, Paul calls each one of us to examine ourselves. Especially when we take communion. And in Galatians 6, 4, it says, each one should test his own actions. What do we do? It's not my job necessary to go around and figure out if you have spiritual life. We need, we, you know yourself a lot more. Okay? If we don't find spiritual life in ourselves, if we say, I don't see the Holy Spirit working like that in my life that, that, that they should. I'm not serving the Lord like I, I'm not helping in the church. I don't see the fruit of the Spirit in my life. What do you need to do? You need to repent. Call out to the Lord asking Him to forgive us. Forgive him. Trust in His grace to make you alive with Him. And if we don't change, if we don't use the knowledge that God has given us right now to take the step by faith that God wants us to take, what will He do? He says, I will come unexpectedly. And this is a warning of judgment. You know, I thought about this. I didn't put this sermon, but I... I Usually, you know, I find out I have not finished a job. Sometimes I have not finished a job. Because when I've been prompted to do something about this, I put it off. Ever done that? Oh, I'll do it later. And later becomes too late. Ever had that happen? I had enough time to do it, but if I would have done it right when I was supposed to do it, I would accomplish the task. So we need to, right now, Jesus says, today is the day of salvation. Today. We need to act. One day, Jesus will put an end to all spiritual souls, shows. He will judge the spiritual dead for their lack in faith of Christ. But if we come to faith in Christ and we, we accomplish the work God wants us to do, what will be the, our reward? It says in Revelation 3, verse 5, the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of the person from the book of life, but will accomplish the name, will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Here we have the interesting phrase, the book of life. What's the book of life? Ever thought of it? Is your name written in the book of life? Revelation 20, verse 15 declares, anyone whose name not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I mean, we're not talking about uh, something that's not important. We're talking something that's very important. Okay? If your name is not found written in the book of life, the Bible declares you will be thrown into the lake of fire. Now, the book of life in this context in uh, Revelation 20 described is a set of names of those who will live with God forever in heaven. It's a role of those who are saved. 
This book of life is also mentioned in, in chapter 20, verse 12, and in Philippians 4, verse 3. The same book is called the Lamb's Book of Life because it contains the names of those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Now, can you be sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Yes. You can be sure that you're saved. What we need to do is repent of sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Once your name is written in the Book of Life, it's never erased. We find this in Revelation. Well, this is, I will not remove your name. Okay? I will write it in and I won't remove it. This is confirmed in Revelation, in Romans chapter 8, verse 37 to 39. Uh, and, and you can read those passages. No true, true believer could ever doubt his eternal security in Christ. John, Jesus says, no one will snatch them from my Father's hand. Now the great white throne judgment, which includes this, anyone who is not found in the book of life, is a judgment of white for unbelievers. And the big passage makes clear that no one at that judgment who has, will be at that judgment who has his name written in the Lamb's book of life. At the, at the same time, it says the fate of the ungodly is sealed. Their names are not there and their punishment is sure. Some people said, oh, uh, Revelation 3 verse 5 is they says a person can lose his salvation. You can be erased from the church, uh, uh, book of life. But uh, they misread the verse. It says the Lord will not erase. It doesn't say be, for, be sure or I will erase. He says I will not erase. There's two different things. You got that? He overcomes, I will not blot out of his name. An overcomer is one who is victorious over temptations and trials and evil of the world, in other words, who is redeemed. Okay, you have the Holy Spirit in your life to change. And that means you're going to be perfect. It means the Holy Spirit will work to help you in, in dealing with that. The saved are written in God's registry and have a promise of eternal security. And my question is this, how about you? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Are you spiritually alive? Or are you a spiritual zombie? With many people leaving this summer, I, and, and we have a, a doubt that in fall there will be a whole massive influx of new people. You think there will be? Mm, I don't know. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes I wonder, will Koinonia last? Will Koinonia live or Koinonia die? Several work, weeks, weeks ago, I experienced a bout of irregular heartbeat as I sat at the, in the office there waiting for the service. I had ate something, I ate too much, and I think what happened is a stum full stomach pushed on my heart and it started beating irregularly. This is what I think now. Um, uh, after consulting with some doctors, I recognize I need, to, I need to walk some more. Okay, so right now I've got my three and a half kilometer uh, route that I try to walk every day and maybe twice a day and do some exercises. I need to eat less, lose some weight, but even if I, I do that, why? Because I, I still see I have unfinished work that I need to do. And if I don't take care of my physical body, I can't do my spiritual work. Okay? So the Bible, the, uh, the Lord gives us wisdom in using the talents and abilities and physical strength and time that we have. Um, but... That time of irregular heartbeat was a warning. It says, okay, change or, or, or you may not serve much more. Uh, and and Dan uh, uh Vitelli said to, to, the, to the people there, said, how old do you think Jim was? Yes. <laughs> I had to laugh. 
Oh, I think he's in his 40s. <laughs> wow. Uh, no, I'm not in my 40s. I said I turned 66. So, um, But if the Lord all of a sudden calls me, and he can call anybody of us. Maybe he calls you to serve in a different way. Let me add one thing here. I was thinking about finishing a job, and I have a book, and I, I didn't have time to read it yesterday. It's called Finishing Well. It talks about how to finish your ministry, to go to the end. And I thought about uh, a prophet in the Old Testament named Elijah. Remember Elijah? Calling down fire to heaven, fighting the idolatry and all that in Israel, and then running away when a woman said, I'm going to kill you. She had power. Anyways. Um, God met him and gave him three instructions. Um, and it's interesting. I thought about, did Elijah finish what God wanted him to do? Interesting. Have you thought about that? God gave him three instructions. He was supposed to he was supposed to prepare his replacement in Elisha. Okay? And he was supposed to anoint Jehu as king over Israel and Isaiah, I think, I can't remember his name uh, right. Isaiah, I can't remember, a, a king over Assyria. Okay? And, and God said, I will punish Israel for their idolatry. I've reserved 7,000 that they have not bowed to the Lord, but I will punish, uh, and whoever, uh, Haziel, Haziel, I think is his name, does not uh, to kill, Jehu will kill, and who Jehu will kill, won't get, uh, Elisha will. But it's interesting, if you read scripture, God took Elijah home before he finished his job. He only prepared Elisha. It was Elisha that ended up uh, anointing Jehu in Haziel. So it's interesting. Uh, did Elijah finish his job? Maybe he finished training Elisha so Elisha could finish the job of, that God had for there. I don't know. But God sometimes calls people to serve in different ways. He's called some of you to leave Koinonia and go to a different place. Will you find your job that God wants you to do in that place? Will you complete it? You know, Koinonia has a reputation of being alive. Okay? People say, oh, this is a lively church. I pray that we will be able to demonstrate the life of Christ in our church. With each other, but also to each one we meet. So people will say, not just have a reputation, but a real there will be real spiritual life. So wherever we go, people can say, this person is truly, really alive. I mean, I mean, let's bow in prayer. Thank you, Father, that you love us. Thank you that you create spiritual life in spiritually dead people. Thank you that you give strength and wisdom and understanding to serve you and serve each other. Thank you that we can love. We can live holy lives. We can walk in a way that is worthy. 
thank you that we can come before you dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, having white clothes. Thank you, Father, that you have given us everything necessary for life and godliness so that we can finish the job that you have set before us. And Lord, if there's someone here who does not know you, who does not have spiritual life, has the outward forms of being alive, but inwardly is spiritually dead. I pray, Lord, that you, by your Holy Spirit, will convict, touch their heart, and help them to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there's someone here who's begun to serve has begun something that you and knows that what you want them to do, but has sort of abandoned it and not finished the work that you have set before them. I pray, Lord, that you will give wisdom and understanding, that you will motivate each one to complete the job that you have set before us. I thank you, Father, that we are not all the same and that you do not give us identical jobs. I thank you that you have gifted us, us differently and so that we can serve in different ways to help the church, help each other, help this world in the way that you want us to. Lead and guide, I pray, and show us what step you want us to take next in our journey with you. I thank you and praise you for what you are doing and what you will do in our lives in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. The verse that we have today, I want us to memorize, is, um, wake up! Okay? Maybe I put somebody to sleep. Sometimes I do that when I preach, okay? Maybe I should do that every... Wake up! No, nobody jumps, so they... Okay. Uh, you, you heard about the, the, the anecdote where uh, a guy was always nodding and, uh, asleep and, uh, and the pastor says loudly, if you need to repent, stand up. And this guy woke up and he stood up. Oh, thank you for repenting. <laughs> <laughs> Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of life. If you have the desire to talk with me about having a faith, having a, a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm available after the service. Maybe you want to talk about a job unfinished. You say, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but I have not finished the job that God set before me. Maybe we can talk about that too. But I pray that the Lord will lead and guide each one of us to do what God wants us to do. In our groups, we can talk about why the gospel, why doesn't the gospel bear fruit in the lives of some people? And here in the, in the passage of Scripture, we have the parable of the soils. The same seed is given to everybody, but people uh, uh, respond differently. Why do they respond differently? I think we haven't talked about in the sermon, but I, you can discuss that in your groups. So I think it'll be interesting. Think about the signs of spiritual life that you, you see in your life and life of others, and how the Lord wants you to share your spiritual life with others this week. So let's, uh, let's think about that in our groups, and may the Lord bless us. Uh, let's right now have a time where we share in our tithes and offerings what the Lord has given to us. Let's do that right now, okay? Choir, would you?
Father, we thank you so much for such a wonderful time in your presence. We thank you for the privilege to come before you to listen to your word. We ask, O oh Lord, that you take away any form of spiritual dormancy in our lives. You help us to demonstrate your love to other people that we meet. We thank you for the opportunity to give to support your work. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we offer this offerings and tithes before you to be used for your work and the blessing that you have in store for us will fill our cups, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, thanks God. Amen. Also, Amen. Dr. Lord.
he who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of his grace. To him be the glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. Uncle Sam. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, uh, we thank God for another wonderful Sunday. And uh, we thank the Almighty for bringing us back. As He left us last Sunday, no one has been sick. Uh, we thank God for His protection. And we thank God for His faithfulness. And we thank, you, we thank God for His love for us. Um, today, it's a very, very important message. The dead church. And pastor asked a very, very serious question. Is Kononia going to die or not? That's a very, very serious question. Because for the past three, I think two years, uh, we have not got any replacement uh, and then we don't know what is going to happen this year and then the following year when um, our doctors and engineers will be leaving us. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we have to pray very hard, very, very hard. Fast and pray that God will have his own way and then bring, bring replacement. Um, any anyone going to his or her hometown, you make sure that uh, you get your replacement when you go home. Get somebody to come and replace you. Yes, and then uh, and God will bless you for that. Amen. Amen. Right. Um. Yeah. You see we, now. Pastor said that. We are all dead. Remember in um, Genesis, Genesis um, two seventeen, two seventeen, when God said to Adam that you can eat of any of the fruits in the garden, but the tree of knowledge and evil you shouldn't touch it, and the very day you touch it you will die. God was not talking about an immediate death. Although after some years, Adam died, but that was not the case. God was talking about spiritual death, that God was talking about the relationship between him and Adam. And you know, Adam was a great man. He was almost like the God on earth. Because if God can bring all these animals we see today to one person, and he said, name them, and he was able to do that, then you know that... Uh, Adam was not, was, he was not a small boy. Yes, he was very, very great in the sight of God. But immediately, immediately after eating the food, the uh, relationship with God just collapsed. And this is what Pastor is telling us this morning, uh, that we are spiritually dead, and by the grace of God, we are spiritually alive. But you see, the spiritually alive is not that. You see, you can be alive, especially when you wake up from bed. You know how it, it, it takes. You wake up from bed as if you are waking up, but you are still sleeping. Has it happened to you before? Yes. This is what is happening to us today. We wake up, we feel that we are getting up. You start shaking your body, but our eyes are closed. We are still dead. And then we can only be spiritually alive when we come to. That is why it is very, very important to come to church every Sunday, at least, to listen to the word of God. You see, the spiritual dead, if you want to be spiritually alive, you must be in line with the word of God. And you don't sit in the house and say, that, oh, I want to be spiritually alive. 
And then you, you do your own thing. You cook and you eat. You look at series and say, oh, I'm okay. Please, that will not help me and you. You have to come to church, listen to the word of God. And by listening to the word of God, God himself will push the word in you and then you will be alive. So those who have not been coming to church for the past months, I don't know what is wrong with them. Um, I am not a judge, and I'm not God to say that they're spiritually dead. But there's something here very important. Pastor said it. He said, each one should what? To test their own actions. So you can only know if you are spiritually dead or not. You can know it yourself. I know where my thoughts are. And then I know trying to ask God to keep me out of those faults so that I'll be spiritually alive. And each and every one knows about it. So please, it's very, very important to test ourselves. You see, um, there's something uh, you, you go to the hospital, as the, the doctors will tell you, and uh, a lady comes and said, oh, are you pregnant? He said, I don't know. Maybe I'm pregnant. You see, pregnancy is not whether you have it or not. Either you are pregnant or you are not. There's no half pregnancy. Doctors, am I right? Yes. So it's the same thing in the spirit. You see, you cannot do that. That, oh, I don't know whether I'm alive or I'm dead. You know everything. So please, ladies and gentlemen, tell the others that they should come to church and then listen to. You see, pastor... The sermon he's been preparing for, you see, it, it takes him time to, da- to prepare all this sermon. You see, he wakes up around 5 o'clock to get all this sermon prepared, prints them, and he comes here and he has to use uh, 45 minutes to download it to us. So when you sit in the house and then, uh, I, I, I can't understand. So ladies and gentlemen, let's try and um, come to church and remember that God is going to judge us according to whatever we do. See the point that um, Pastor was saying about the, this building. See, he came here when was that? 23 years ago. And uh, yes, um, yes, this building started in 1976. Yeah, 76 years. Um, either 76 or 75. Yeah, around that time. Because when we came here, the building was there. So we're calling it ancient building. Yes, it stood for a long time. And then it came to a time they were even afraid to complete because they were afraid, as Pastor said, whether it would shake or not. And it was very, very serious. So he has, they have to wait for some times and then bring some, I mean, new engineers to come and try the whole system. And then after the approval, they decided to continue this building. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Pastor has given us um, some questions to answer, and he said we should read. Um, he didn't put some of them in the sermon, but he's um, encouraging us to read uh, in our groups. And we are glad that we've got a pastor who is always trying to trying to build us up. He's trying to make us spiritually awake. Although no one is perfect, only Jesus who is perfect, but we can be perfect if we follow the word of God and do what the Bible says. We know pastor will be leaving very soon. And I'm warning you that nobody should say that pastor is not away, so I will not come to church. Please, you get my message if I don't see you in church. Because Kononia is not for Pastor Jim. It's not. It's for Jesus Christ. It's the church of God. So if pastor is not around and you, you decide to relax, I mean... Uh, I mean, what are, what are I trying to say? Maybe when pastor goes to America, that is the time Jesus will come for rapture. And then you'll be staying in your house looking at series 
and then Jesus comes to church to Kononi on Sunday, and he comes to see five people in the church. And he said, Who had I know? And I had I know he's always at last. So please take it very, very serious. Because I know the minds of I'm not a magician, I'm not a, a, a prophet, but I'm prophesying today that some people have made their mind that pastor goes away, they take holidays. Please don't do that. Come to church every Sunday and listen to the word of God. Because you see, why do we come to church? Why? You see, God has given us the mandate. You see, there's one thing God cannot do for himself. God is all, almighty. God cannot praise himself. He cannot do that. That is why we come to church and sing praises to the almighty. Because he cannot do it. And he has given us the chance to do it. And even to come on Sunday to say thank you, Jesus, for looking after me and my family for the whole week. Even it's a problem. Why? I don't understand. So please, a word to a wife is enough. So now we are going to pray for our senior pastor. We know the plans he has for this summer. He's taking the children to America. Olia will be will not take the trip with Lilia. So we have to still continue to pray for them. Because he's our father and our shepherd, and then we don't have to live without praying for him. So at this time, with all eyes closed, with one accord, we are going to pray for our senior pastor. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this afternoon. Father, we have given you praise. We are giving you worship. We have listened to your word. We have given you offering. Father, we thank you for the life of our senior pastor and the wonderful work you are doing through him. Father, we are asking that you bless him the more. Give him more wisdom. We are asking for good health. We are asking for long life. Father, we are praying that his plans for this week will be successful. And all the days of his life will be a successful week for him. We are committing his plans unto your mighty hands. You know his trip to America with the family. We are praying that you continue being their guide. You continue helping them in all that they are doing. And then you put, pour your blessings on their plans. And whatever they do will be successful. Father, we are committing their family as well into your mighty hand. We are asking you to protect the family from all evil. We stand in the name of the only name your son Jesus Christ and rebuke all the demonic and satanic activities around the family. That you cover them with your blood, you break the devil's plan and then you give them success in whatever they do. Father, we are asking that as we are living here, you will not live alone. Thank you for your word which has come to us. We are asking that you help us to be spiritually alive. Pastor, Lord, we are dead in some of the ways, then we need to wake up. Father, is, we can do it only with your help. So we are asking that we help us and wake us up. And then we continue to be in your presence from now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Yes. Um, before I continue, um, we are having a church council meeting immediately after uh, group meeting. So all ch um, church council members, please don't run away. Just stay around. And then uh, we'll have a short meeting uh, before we leave. Um, right out of the service. Any newcomer here? Yes. Um, we are in June, six months now has passed. Who is here for the first time since the beginning of this year? Yes, I can see the faithful ones. Yes. I was telling uh, Joe uh, last week or so that uh, I was just searching my papers and then and I saw a list and I was very, very surprised. And the list was a name of members of Colonia, all the members. And there were 
marks on them. Those who are regular visitors, those who come to church once in a month, and those who come once in every three months. And I was surprised. Yes, and some who come to only Christmas parties and end of year parties. You see, uh, and I, I was telling Joe that, hey, how did this, this list came to? It's very, very surprising. And that is real. That is what is happening here. So please, tell your neighbors, well, you are all staying with the, uh, people in the flat and your hostel. When you wake up and come into church, maybe the person is not in the mood. Tell the person, oh, sister, brother, uh, today is Sunday. Let's go to church. See the point now. Wait for the person. He said, oh, I don't even... Please, pull the person out of the bed. Make sure that he, he or she takes it back, dress out, and then you bring him to church. And God will bless you for that. Amen. Because, you see, if you come to church and you get your blessing and your the roommate or your flatmate is lying down, uh, it's not good because the Bible says we do what we care for each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. So please, let's remember that way. Amen. Amen. Right. Wednesday church service, uh, midweek service is still around. And then um, there was a question last week that which is going to be decided, I think the, the leaders are going to decide whether we should um, continue midweek service um, after June. Joe, is it? Is it? Yes, after June. As we do it always uh, during the summer holidays. Um, so please, um, it's going to be, they are going to decide whether we should continue or not. Um, and last Wednesday, we learned, we learned a lot. Uh, we learned that we have taken the grace of God and the love of God for granted. We've taken it for granted. God is helping us to do certain things, helping us to pass our exams, helping us to get through, get some breakthroughs. And then instead of thanking God for what he's doing for us, we have taken it for granted. We think that it's our own help and our own will uh, by which we've done it. And last Wednesday, we learned that that is not true. It's the grace of God, so we shouldn't take it for granted. So the service continues this Wednesday. So please, let's come together and learn some great things. Because we saw, um, we had the opportunity, it was, a film, it was a film show on Wednesday, and it was very, very um, interesting about Samson. How God anointed him, and then he gave his anointing away um, by getting involved with um, what is the name of the wife? Delilah. Yes. Uh, so, men, you are warned. It's not every tie of a woman you put your head on and uh, will confuse you. Uh, so, that doesn't mean that you don't have to love a woman. Uh, when you fall in love, you must be a conscious man. Amen. Yes. Saturday prayer meeting is coming on at 6 p.m. Um, Sunday, 1 p.m., we meet here and then we sanctify ourselves before the main service. And the main service starts at 2 o'clock, as usual. Um, any birthdays this week? Yes, Beulah, who is online. Beulah, please. Um, hallelujah. Um, on the 26th of uh, June, that's next week, Saturday, we'll be having a uh, Beulah meeting, after prayer meeting, 7 o'clock. And it will be a, a movie night. So please, when you're coming, please bring like the ladies also along. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. All right. Yes. Um, today, today, today is Father's Day, and then uh, uh, I have to congratulate all the fathers in this house, uh, Pastor Jim and uh, Patrick um, uh, and myself. And uh, uh, yes. Uh, yes, I was, uh, yes, that's very, 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 very interesting 
very very interesting and uh, I was watching it somebody sent me a video very 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 a, a girl of about um, maybe five six she woke up in the morning and started crying the mother asked what is wrong with you she said oh uh, my senior sister has given birth and then uh, that's why she's crying he said I also want to give birth he said hey is that true he said yes and the mother asked, uh, how many children do you want to have? Five. Five children. And he said, God bless you in Jesus' name. That you will and the guest said, Amen. Today is Father's Day. And then um, people are ready to sing for fathers yes. in the church. Yes. Because they know that Jesus is the winner man. And we are on the winning side. The fathers here are on the reading side. So please come along and sing for the fathers of the church. Mihunia me, ye, mihunia me, ka. Yana me, say, be, wa mama, say, be, a ye, ye, re, ye, ye, wa ye, na ye, ma, o, wa ma, me, ni, a, je, wa ma, me, ni, a, je, wa ma, me, hu, wa, to, mihunia me, ye, mihunia me, ka. Wanya mi sebi, wamama sebi, aye yire, ye yiwa ye, na ye ma wusu, aye ya ye ya ye yire, aye yire, aye yire, ye be yiwa ye da, ye yiwa, ye yiwa ye da, ye be da. Da da, 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 da da,
Yesu bayave pour moi oh dada me di Yesu me di Yesu bayave pour moi ah dada amen amen thank you very much for your beautiful song we we thank God for Father's Day and uh, may God bless all the fathers in this house. Yes. That God will supply all their needs. Yes. Thank you for coming and may God bless you. Don't forget we are moving into groups. If your group members are not around, please join other groups so that we finish it quick and then uh, we go to the council meeting. May God bless each and every one of us, protect us from all evil, and then bring us back next Sunday to give praises to his holy name. Thank you for coming and God bless you all. Amen.